You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit HankGarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is Sadie Jo. Thanks for tuning in to Author Stories today. We've got a fantastic show lined up for you. Before we get into that, I'd like to tell you about some sponsors today. Crystal Pico Watanabe at Pico's House. The Pico's House website now has a new look. She's got a team of eight people who help provide services to fiction authors. And she has a full slate of services that now include beta reading. She's got four beta readers now. So if you're looking for beta reading services, she can definitely take on your project. Manuscript critique, developmental editing, line editing, copy editing, and proofreading. Authors can also inquire about putting their books in her book lover's box, which is a monthly digital subscription box with a different theme each month. It's free to authors for a limited time. Be sure to check out Crystal and her whole team at Pico's House. That's P-I-K-K-O-S-H-O-U-S-E dot com. Thanks, Crystal, for sponsoring the show. While Cape and Spandex movies are breaking box office records, comic book commentator and influencer Ed Gosney doesn't want us to forget the roots of these marvelous wonders. His blog, Cool Comics in My Collection at edgosney.com, covers the gamut of four-color entertainment from contemporary comic books to comics made for kids to bargain bin gold to classics that will transport you back in time. Comic books are a perfect blend of art and story, and Cool Comics captures the essence of what these funny books mean to us in a personal way. And make sure to join the Cool Comics in My Collection Facebook group where members can interact, show off their prized comics, and have opportunities to win, you guessed it, Cool Comics. Published weekly, Cool Comics in My Collection aims to bring you a smile and reminds us why comic books are fun. Be sure to visit edgosney.com today. Speaking of superheroes and comics, my friend Patricia Gillum has a fantastic series called The Heroes of Corvus. It begins with book one. A flight between a second-generation superhero named Red Bolt and a villain for hire named Icarus goes terribly wrong, resulting in the drowning deaths of three innocent civilians and orphaning a six-year-old boy. Racked with guilt, Red Bolt visits Cameron Wilson at the hospital every night and won't leave the boy's side until he falls asleep. Befriended by a night shift nurse, the man in costume begins to disclose what really happened after the fight and why he feels the deaths of Cameron's parents and sister fall on his actions. A superhero didn't survive that night, and Cameron and the rest of the city aren't out of danger. This is such a phenomenal story. Uh, She has released up to part four now, and I cannot wait for part five to come out. If you're looking for a great adventure read that's uh, on the cutting edge of what is in today's entertainment, The Heroes of Corvus is the series for you by Patricia Gillum. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to go to HankGarner.com to subscribe to the show. We're on just about every platform you can imagine. Now stay tuned for our show. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Sadie Jones on the show with me. She has a phenomenal new book called The Snakes, and when you're hearing this, it'll be out available everywhere. Welcome to the show, Sadie. Oh, thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Well, thank you for joining me. Uh, We begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? Oh, I don't have a a memory of wanting to be one. I think my earliest memories would be writing. Um, Just sort of, it was always the thing that I did and the thing I loved doing, but never, it was never an ambition ambitions so much as just you know what would I do for a proper job while while I was writing (laughs) so I remember writing a lot of stories and stories with pictures and plays when I was small and then I got my first agent when I was uh 21 or two I think oh so just you know I I have this theory that that people are born storytellers um and then if you choose to you know pursue 
the path of a writer, then then you know that that can be a separate thing. But I I really think that there's a a gene or a gift or however you want to you know call that. But uh, I think some people are just born storytellers, and it sounds like you uh, were born with that gift as well. No, I I agree with you, and I think it, I feel the same about actors and um, exactly artists. You just find particular. I mean, I was very lucky. Came from a a creative. I mean, my father was a writer. So I've always thought there's a sort of mixture of nature and nurture in there. But I'm always fascinated to hear about people who just at the age of five knew they wanted to act or write and and they came from something completely different and their parents were farmers or builders or teachers, you know, <laughs> and that, that, right. that really fascinates me. It, it does me as well. And, and you know, that is the, the age old argument over nature versus nurture. And um, I, I, I've met equal amounts of people that they were surrounded by creative people and it just naturally came to them. And, and then, you know, there's that, that odd duck. Sometimes it just stands up in the yeah. middle of a, a family and says, I'm a writer. And, and yeah. they're like, Oh, well, okay then. Um, were you an avid reader, uh, as a youngster? Yes. And, um, again, I think such a lucky generation because yeah. there was so little else to do. Right. So we were either playing in the garden or reading or writing or making things, spaceships out of cardboard boxes. And it just, <laughs> you know, I, I guess for hundreds of years, that was children's lives. There was not right. much, I mean, there was television, but it was, you know, not very amazing or interesting. And we had three channels until I was, you know, my late teens, I guess. So exactly. that's, a, that's a real gift. I think boredom, boredom is the best <laughs> thing for the mind. <laughs> yes. yes, it is. <laughs> Um, was there a, a particular um, a book or series of books that just really um, kind of blew open your imagination and, and made you feel a part of the story? The Narnia books were absolutely, you know, the C.S. Lewis, those books, when I, I remember, I mean, I would read them and reread them and the, going through the wardrobe into the snow. The, he has, C.S. Lewis has this extraordinary, really visceral, emotional, and they were very unfashionable in England at the time because really? it was the 70s and, you know, sort of liberal left wing. It was, they were, I remember people sort of go, oh, you know they're about God, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, I mean, there are worse things for books to be about, but I guess they thought that they were preachy. So they were, you know, they assumed that we were all going to read everything and that you could be picky ab about things. But, I mean, those books are absolute genius. And I wasn't thinking about the allegory, but I was in love with the morality. And I did, I think children, all of us need that, uh, you know, the, the, how immediate and um, uh, how urgent our need for, for good and bad and justice, particularly in children's books. And then as we get older, we're, we're looking to understand things. And I think that's partly why those books are so enduring. I, I had a similar experience with Narnia. And um, maybe in America, the uh, I think that attitude about the allegory of it maybe came later. Um, maybe that's a, a newer phenomenon. I'm, I'm not exactly sure. But I was also a kid of the 70s. And uh, I I remember loving those books and just being transported, uh, you know, similarly to the kids in the wardrobe. It, it had a, um, a, a, sim a similar kind of visceral, uh, mm. you know, hold on me. And it wasn't until much later in life that I even allowed myself to think of the whole, uh, allegorical nature of it. And, and was there a deeper meaning and, and, or, you know, sometimes not even deeper, sometimes just right there on the surface. Yeah. Um, but to me, they were just, they were just fantastic stories. Oh, they and, were. and, and I think that was Lewis's real gift was to to be able to to bring us into that world without uh, without the baggage of uh, interpreting all that. Maybe um, no, yes, it was there, and it, but it was just magical. It was, and it was about being your best self. Right. And the children. What was so wonderful? Do you remember how they lost their ages when they went to Narnia? They stopped being eight or thirteen or they just were people. Right. And that, that's such a profound thing to do in fiction, to, to be able to 
have the sort of true identity of the characters without them being hampered by being school children. So they were in battles and they were as strong as adults. There was no um, sort of boundary to their, to, well, to our imaginations reading them, I guess, which was amazing. Gosh, those books made me cry as well. The Last Battle. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I love them. I still love them. I know. Um, do you feel like that you've carried anything from those books or from the experience of those books into your writer life today? Yes, I think that the books we read as children and, and sort of up until our mid-twenties, you know, your fav- those favorite books, I think they never leave you. And I have, I think, just deeply held beliefs in magical things that I have, you know, unicorns and <laughs> all of those things which are as real to me as they probably, it's embarrassing. I should be embarrassed. I really, I'm very bad at knowing what's real and what isn't generally. And I think that they've, and, and also the way that his language, the way that he wrote was very clean and very, it wasn't exactly the vernacular, but it was very immediate and chatty sort of straight off the page and his descriptions were um they weren't flowery but they were so rich so i think probably his prose influenced me right there's uh that's one reason i i like to ask those kinds of questions to people because i i like you believe that those early influences stick with us in one way or another and the the themes and the uh sometimes genre and 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 those types of things come back around and, and influence the, the art that we make. And uh, mm-hmm. I, I just love to hear about those early influences. And later in life, when you find grown-up books that you love, you, you know, I realized all his classical references and all the things that he, you know, all, that obviously he was brought up with Latin and Greek and all of those stories. So when you're reading your Shakespeare later and seeing all of those roots, that's always, that, that's a wonderful thing. Because he was such an educator as well. Right, exactly. Well, well, let's fast forward a little bit to um, to when you started writing fiction. Uh, you said that you it was just one of those things that you just always did. But uh, at what point did you begin writing with the intention that the things that you were writing were going to go to a wide audience and that you were going to try your hand as a published author? I was um, well. I left school at eighteen. Um, I did. A levels, which I guess with you is finishing high school, and then I didn't go to university, partly because I was just very bad at being educated, and I, <laughs> I kind of knew <laughs> I knew that I was going to waste my time and behave badly, and I sort of wanted to experience life. Little did I know how I would, you know, adore the idea of three years off reading <laughs> later on. But I, I was so I went and did waitressing and traveling and different things. And I just, I wrote a screenplay while I was living in Paris. I was teaching English as a foreign language and living in a attic, <laughs> literally. And it was an extraordinary time and I was quite lonely and I wrote this screenplay that was, you know, the, the obvious semi-autobiographical um, thing uh, about an experience I'd had. And I sent it to uh, uh, William Morris in London and they took me on. So I kind of came whizzing back thinking, I'm going to... You know, I'm going to be, I thought I'd be Woody Allen, basically, <laughs> that I would be that and, and William Goldman, you know. <laughs> and then I just was semi-unemployed for years, um, actually learning how to, how to do the job, which is a lifetime thing. So it was a quick start, but then a kind of slow, slow from then on. Was that first book The Outcast? No, The Outcast. So that was The Outcast was first a screenplay, and that was, oh, almost 20 years after that, 15, wow. 18 years maybe after that. So I was a screenwriter, unproduced, but sort of getting hired, having things in development, toiling, um, wanting to give up, not able to give up for years and years and years. <laughs> and then when I was 38, and I had my husband and my children and all of that, wrote The Outcast as a film script, and then as a book. What was the, you wrote it as a, as a script first and then a book. What was the, the thought process that, that you went through 
to realize that this should be a novel and not necessarily for the screen? Well, I I think I was very um, alarmed by the idea of writing a novel, and I I wasn't. I liked the idea of the collaboration of film. I was terrified of prose. Um, so it was sort of, I was keeping myself safe by seeing myself as a dramatist in a way. And also I think it was a, such a training ground for making stories when you can't hide behind language. So the, the, but then the outcast had just this extraordinary life to it. And I was so um, more obsessed by it. And it was running in my mind in a way that hadn't happened to me before that was sort of almost alarming. And I just couldn't, the, the film script was in development and not getting anywhere. And people were saying how good it was. And then it was just, it was the basic development hell. And so I wrote the novel really to keep myself sane because the childhood of the central character was unspooling in my mind and I just had to put it down. So I thought I'd just have to write a book. <laughs> I basically thought... I, I'm going to be failing in two areas now. <laughs> you know, that's great. But then, um, by a happy coincidence, uh, it, it it was published, it was seen, and and that was kind of that. And it, it did really, really well at home. What is the what's the story of the Outcast? What what is that book about? It's a story. It's set in the 1950s in. Um, sort of suburban, semi-rural England. I was, it was a story about a, a very unhappy, damaged teenage boy um, who is considered unacceptable and terrible by everybody around him. And I thought the worst place to be a teenage boy would be 1950s Surrey in England. <laughs> you know, he, he's, he's barely heard of Elvis. And he's, he witnesses his mother drowning early in his life, and his father is very repressed and ill-equipped to deal with it. And he he grows up um, really just turning his pain on himself and not knowing how to manage. And it's the story of how he um, blossoms, eventually learns, you know, through through wanting to look after the the girl he has known from childhood, who's having it in an abusive family. And when he discovers that, he discovers um, something other than his own pain, and he grows up. So it's really a, a coming-of-age story. You, um, you said that you avoided writing the novel uh, in the beginning, that it was uh, you, you were really avoiding prose. Um, after having this book finished and out and then it finding an audience, what did that do for your writing confidence? Oh, it's such a bizarre thing when that happens. Having I was so used to sort of writing in a vacuum and comforting myself or cheering myself up and, you know, doing being my own carrot and stick. <laughs> but when that book happened, um it suddenly there was a sort of there was a, a bidding war over it. I mean it wasn't a huge amount of money, but I mean even one person wanting it was astounding. And then it, it won prizes and it was a massive bestseller in Britain. And so I knew that I had to kind of start the next one really quickly. So luckily, I had started the second one before The Outcast came out so that that extraordinary flip of experience where everything changed for me, I was already, I had one foot in another world in my next book. So I was slightly cushioned from it. And I, I think what happens is the demons that you have at one point in your life, you know, before I was published, the demons were, you'll never get anywhere. This will, you know, you'll, you're probably not good enough. No one will ever see this. And then they immediately switch. They don't go away. They just turn into, it won't be as successful as the next, as the last one. <laughs> this one will never do what the first one did. It'll be the disappointing second novel. So whatever you do, you have these <laughs> these demons on your shoulder when you're working that you have to learn to put aside. You know, we talk a lot uh, on the show about the the gift of anonymity that comes with writing the first novel, and how uh, that 
before that novel is out there, no one knows that you're writing it. No one's expecting it. There are no expectations on you other than, you know, self-imposed ones. Uh, but then after that first book comes out, especially if it's a success, then, like you said, there there comes a whole different level of pressure and and expectations that come with that, and um, how do you how do you deal with that to to make it through that to kind of solidify in your mind? Okay, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. I can do this. Um, and you know, so, what if the second book is you know doesn't do what the first one does? This is still my life's work. Well, I, I what's the phrase you use? The gift of, anony- of anonymity. Yes, it's a wonderful phrase. That's so exactly right, and and you don't realize what a gift it is until you get there where suddenly you're not alone in your study. You feel like there are eyes on it. Um, and that it's, uh, it's like having sort of the, the light put up in the auditorium and suddenly seeing everyone staring at you. It's horrible. <laughs> but I suppose what I, what I do consciously now um, with it, and, and it's part of the discipline, just, you know, dealing with the demons is just, I don't, well, I'm, I'm lucky in one way because I don't have a, like a two book deal or a three book deal. I go book by book. So I, I can say to myself with some conviction, nobody need ever see this. And, and I say that to myself every time I start work <laughs> and I'll sort of sit down and I just think, it's fine. Sometimes I'll have to write with my eyes closed because I'm self-conscious. But I'll, or I'll just think, you know, you're, who cares? You know, so you, this could be terrible. Otherwise, you can't take the risk. You know, you have, to, you have to write the thing you must never write, I think. Right. You know. I, I can only imagine what that pressure is like for someone who's writing a long-standing series and one that that readers become so invested in characters and 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 sometimes readers know more about the characters than the writers do it seems you know that they they take such care with every little detail um i i, I love that idea of of each book just allowing the book to be its own thing and um you know each book has its own journey yes exactly and thinking you know well if i and that's also when you're writing there's sort of two states, I think. There's one, which is this is just absolutely horrible and I've got a long way to go and I would never dream of showing it to anyone. And then there's the other one where you're, I just have to show it to someone. Someone has to see this. Someone has to read it. You might not think it's wonderful, but you feel compelled to have other people look at it. And and then, you know, what can you do then? You take your chances. Is there a moment in the writing where the the story becomes alive and and takes on a life of its own and where it becomes bigger than you are and bigger than your control uh, and you just kind of stand back and become part of the process along with the book? Yes, um, those are the bits you really hope and pray for. (laughs) I feel, you know, that I'm most of the time just peddling and struggling and trying to get the engine started and doing all the what I call the maths of the story and trying to, you know, get my structure and make it seem as though it's alive and on fire and all those things. And then there's this wonderful moment or series of moments where it has its own life and its own energy. And suddenly you're, oh, okay. <laughs> now, I mean, I've, I've, the best bit, uh, when I, I, what, and what I really struggled to achieve is the feeling of transcribing the thing that I'm seeing or that's already happened. So when mm. I write, I spend a lot of time picturing a scene or a conversation or a place and then trying to describe it rather than I always feel I'm in trouble if I'm making it up on the page. So that I tend to work that way around. But sometimes if that's not happening, I just have to write through and wait for it to catch light that way. When when you start imagining a new story, uh, and maybe it's a novel, maybe it's a screenplay, uh, whatever, what usually comes to you first? Is it a character? Is it a, a setting? Is it uh, maybe a provocative headline that you, you know, read earlier? Um, what's usually the, the genesis for the for the kernel of the story that, that begins to grow? Um, it can be 
all or any of the above. It each one has its own um, different. With the uninvited guest, it was I had a dream about a house, and I woke up, and I and I thought. I've dreamt that same house before, but it was at a different time in history, and there were different people there. And it was suddenly like sort of being given a present. I thought, oh, okay. Oh, well, right. That's a book. That's <laughs> if that house exists, then I, I need to find a story for that house. And with um, The Outcast, it was, it was the phrase, I think there's, there's something wrong with him. There's something wrong with him. Just kept going around my mind. And that sort of gave birth to the character, and then I built the story around him. With small wars, it was the news. It was Afghanistan and Iraq and um, all the stories of war crimes that were coming out, torture, and that got me thinking. Um, and with Fallout, I don't remember what started that out. I'm not sure. But they all have a different, they all have a different spark. Right. And maybe it's good that you don't remember the spark. That just means that the, the story became so alive, it's its own thing. Yeah. Let's, yeah. let's put it that way. Let's say it was that. <laughs> <laughs> well, your new book, uh, The Snakes, which is uh, out available now when people are hearing this, um, is is really, uh, in in a lot of ways to me, a uh, hearkening back to, to Narnia in this story of, uh, of, it's kind of this bigger story within a story and um, kind of these... Uh, these ideas and themes of of good and evil, and uh, I, I can I can definitely see that influence in this book, and um, uh, maybe not on the surface, but uh, as we talk about it, I can see that. Um, what was the? Where did this book begin for you? That's so interesting. You say that I hadn't thought of that at, at all, but of course, yes. Yeah. Um, this it started. Oh, I it was twenty sixteen. Um, and I knew, I, for some reason, I knew it was going to be in France um, and that it was a good and evil story and in some ways a morality tale, which was sort of alarming. Um, <laughs> and then I was living, I was in a state of sort of rage and frustration with the news and I knew that I originally wanted to set it in the 1930s in Europe because of the good and evil and the sort of rise of evil and then and then I thought well we all know how that turned out you know? <laughs> and the thing about the modern world with all of the dreadful things that are happening um, and the polarity of and different movements and different things and um, the unsettled politics across Europe and everywhere uh, I, I I I needed to have that sense of urgency that I had and have of waking up in the morning and not knowing what's going to happen next. Um, so it had to be a contemporary book. So then I, I ditched 30s Europe and made it modern and and then found my characters for it, um, really through, uh, through the sins and the virtues. There was a lot of allegory in the book. Um, those building blocks were sort of, now you're talking about Narnia, of course. Those those building blocks of of, of you know, sin and um, transgression and um, all of all of that stuff was there as sort of the, the pillars of it. Did it surprise you when when you changed the setting to to a modern setting and uh, and the the story started working, started clicking? Um, did that surprise you that it was easier to tell that story now? It was the thing that made it come alive um, and so took it out of out of the freezer. It was a relief, yeah, probably a surprise. I think the there was a, again relief because it seemed it, it felt very ambitious. Um, I was very nervous of writing a the way we live now novel. I've never wanted to do that and so really the job of it was to find a way of making that, um, coming at that sideways, making that, that's, you know, it's a, it's a thriller, essentially. It's, in many ways, it's horror. I wanted it to be um, as human and small a story. Uh, you know, it's about a marriage and this, this young married couple. And so I needed to hide all of, all of those huge themes in 
the small story of those people and that family. And that was really when it took off. Um, tell us about the character of B, um, that, uh, that is kind of the central character. Um, where did she come from and, and what is her struggle in the story? B is, um, she's, she's a good person, which is a nightmare to write. <laughs> she, <laughs> villains, you know, they're full of chat and, they're, you you can make people sympathize with them against their will and you know, all of that. But a good person, um, she was very difficult, and I loved her. And I found her frustrating to write because she is so unforgiving of herself. She has very high moral standards um, and sort of coupled with low self-esteem. But I, I felt this tremendous loyalty to her because I think that she felt very much, I would think, you know, here I am writing this good person. She's doing and saying things that we are all, most of us, doing and saying in everyday life. We, we all want people to be nicer to each other. We all want to be more forgiving. We all, you know, feel essentially generous and put upon by people behaving badly around us. And writing that was unbelievably hard because feeling that is so universal. But um, she was really tough to write, and um, I, I really, I, I, I hope I did her justice. Well, the the book, uh, the snakes, is like we said, out available everywhere now. Um, when when you have a uh, a story that is this emotional and this uh, dark in a lot of places, um, but then there there are moments of levity uh, in it. Is that a um, is that a conscious effort when you're writing to uh to realize okay this is this has been pretty deep for a while let's let the reader off the hook for just a minute um is, is that something that you plan through or is it just part of of uh of you as the writer that begins to come out I'm not sure where how I would unravel that knot I think it's <laughs> it's it's both things it's partly instinct it's partly my own um you you can have had enough of a of a thing. You begin to feel worn down by it. So I, I suppose it's a story instinct. She, um, there was it, a lot of it came the marriage, which is Beatrice and Dante was they. So she's B and he's Dan, and he is the very human side of it, and she is you know the what a lot of women go through a lot being the good one, the one who's being inspiring and generous and, you know, <laughs> the, the light and the flame for him to follow. And so the, their relationship and their marriage kind of provided, I think, some of what you're talking about, that some of the laughs and the interaction between them, they're having a pretty difficult time, but they're very, um, you, you know, they have some humor about it, I think. Yeah. Well, and sometimes it really uh, puts a uh, an exclamation point on some of the darkness uh, when you can have a little wry laugh about it. Uh, th- there's something about dark humor that uh, maybe uh, speaks to some uh, twisted <laughs> sense in all of us, maybe. <laughs> no, absolutely. And, and as you say, yeah. it is a really dark book, and um, and it, it's about grief. A lot of the book is about grief, and two things that I have observed personally about grief. One, that it is like like being in a very dark thriller where you feel hunted down, and that's what the book feels like, I think, um, and felt like to write. And the other is that you have, you laugh at the weirdest things, and it's rather surreal and heightened. So um, it, it was a challenge to, to go that dark and to and and to be truthful about what that's like, you know. Yeah. Well, you say that the the book is about grief, um, and and it definitely is, and you, you get that sense as a reader. Um, but when you're writing, sometimes you don't know what the story is about until the end, and then you start kind of reading back over and putting the pieces together, and you say, "Oh, I see where I was going here." Even even if it was just your subconscious mind that was taking you there, and and then you, with your analytical mind, p- 
piece it together afterward. Is there ever a moment in the book, in the writing, that you, that the threads start coming together and you're like, oh, okay, I know what this is now? Uh, or is it just a, the journey of the writing and then it all comes together afterward? Um, that's really well expressed. I don't think I'll be so articulate about it. I I think, well, I, I always know my ending. Um, so I know what I'm aiming for, and I'm never surprised by that. But where I am surprised or where I do get lost or where I'm trying to find it, and often those paths will go off in different directions, and or I'll have to you know, cut 50 pages and go back to the last bit where it worked. All of that happens in the in the middle, but I I always um, I know where I'm trying to get, and I and I know that my ending is going to describe do exactly what you said, describe frame the story retrospectively and make sense of it all. And this book, having it it um, it dodges about a lot, and it sets up expectations and then um, confounds them. So that was a that I mean that was a it was a real challenge to do knowing where I was going with it. Right. Well, Sadie, I absolutely love the book and I love what you're doing. Um, the Snakes is is phenomenal. It's one of those books that will linger with you uh, for a while afterwards. And um, I love what you're doing. If there's a place, is there a place online where people can connect with you if they want to learn more about you and maybe follow along with new news and all of that good stuff? Uh, yes, I'm on Twitter. Uh, that's Sadie Jones and um, Instagram, that's Sadie Jones. And then my, um, it, in this country, it will be HarperCollins. They would have an author page for me. And um, in the UK, it's Random House, Penguin Random House Chatter Book. So if anyone looks, they can definitely find me. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to uh, to follow you and to uh, to pick up the new book. Uh, Sadie, thank you so much for taking time to come on the show today. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks for listening to this episode of Author Stories. Go to hankgarner.com to find all of the archives of the show, and be sure to subscribe while you're there. Now stay tuned for a special audiobook clip from Richard Gleaves' The Jason Crane Series. The ancient building wore the severe cassock colors of a Puritan minister a uniform monochrome of slate-gray shingles and soot-gray clabberts. Its shadowed upper windows cross-hatched like the facets of a spider's eye. The second story protruded beyond the first and bore the house's only ornament, two gray teardrops of wood, weeping from each corner of the building's stiff upper lip. The place would have looked sinister and foreboding in its shadowed alley if not for the die-cut silhouette of a dancing sheep, jaunty above the door, and the two front bay windows that blazed with colorful, welcoming light. The windows were hung with orbs of colored glass on staggered lengths of ribbon. Each orb glowed with autumnal reds and delicate greens, burgundy tints and pumpkin hues, dappled raspberry and clover lime, streaked with light and weightless as bubbles over a cauldron. The shelves below offered crystal skulls and silver daggers and horny devils, Celtic chalices and woven dream catchers in dreamcoat hues. A primitive broom leaned in a corner, ready for flight, and a rhapsodic nude in bronze clutched her goat-legged lover beneath a jackal bust of Anubis. The interior of the shop was even witchier. Above a crude and sooty fireplace, a stack of brick barely holding the shape of a chimney pushed through the barn-high roof, threading ancient beams that crisscrossed overhead. Brooms and kettles and Christmas lights dangled from these, alongside Halloween costumes and Chinese umbrellas, pointy hats and bundles of herbs. Jason wandered deeper into the shop. His fingers trailed across strange bronze statuary and Aztec masks of turquoise and lapis lazuli. He rolled his eyes at the luck candles and money charms, but goggled indecently at a nude and anatomically correct silver nymph with long golden hair that reminded him of Kate. See anything you like? Jason jumped, turned, and jumped again. The woman standing before him was the living embodiment of every hippy-dippy counterculture type he'd ever seen. Her hair was green, her face pale and round, her doughy body wrapped in some elaborately woven ethnic garb. Her eyebrows were black and pierced in little rows, and her eyes were heavily circled with midnight blue, 
as if she'd been sucker punched by an oil slick. She tapped the glass over the nymph. Admiring the goddess, I see. Oh, uh, um. Uh. She practically caught him with porn. You want to hold her? She won't break. Here. The woman flipped open a glass door and handed Jason the naked figure. See how heavy she is? You could bang her against the wall all day and barely make a dent. She waggled her eyebrows, obviously enjoying his discomfort. He checked the price tag. Seven hundred bucks? The goddess is a symbol of love and fertility. Don't be ashamed of desiring her. The woman's long green fingernails plucked a long black cigarette from a long red case, and she lit it. I sense, she blew smoke and studied its whirls. Dissatisfaction in love? Yes, I have just the thing. She pulled Jason into a side room where the smell of her clove smoke gave way to the skunky aromas of potpourri sachets, tea leaves, and hanging clutches of twiggy flowers. She searched, found a little bundle, and pressed it into his hand. This will make you irresistible. Rub it on your nethers twice a day, and love shall surely find you. Jason made a face. The bundle smelled like cow manure. He didn't even want that on his hands.